Uh, okay, so first, thank you very much, Yang and Gu Liang, for the nice invitation. I actually wasn't aware of this seminar, so it's nice to have another thing to attend during this, all these <coughs> lonely times. Uh, so thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a paper, a recent paper of mine with Alessandro Vignati, and it's on uh, automorphisms of row algebras and course equivalences, a similarity between the structure of those two. Oh, and I must say that I'm in the University of Virginia at the moment, and I'm a postdoc there. Okay, so, uh, so I was told that there were going to be a lot of PhD, uh, not a lot, but some PhD students here as well. So I wrote an introduction to everything. So I, well, sorry for the specialists that will be bored in the beginning of the talk. Uh, but let me start with the very basics here. So an overview in uh, course geometry, at least of the part that I will care about. So here, uh, we won't be looking more gen in full generality to coarse spaces. Uh, we can restrict to, to metric spaces. And uh, for us, if you have two maps, uh, it will be uh, often more than fine that they are not really the same, but the concept of them being uh, the same up to a finite bound, let's say, so they are being uh, uniformly close to each other, it's okay. And we call maps with this property closed maps. Now, this is the kind of morphism we're going to be looking at. Those are, the map is called coarse if it sends bounded sets to bounded sets. And this is done in a uniform way, uh, meaning that for each R you have an S for which this happens. So you can guarantee that X and Y are at most R apart. Sorry, we can guarantee that if X and R are most R apart, then their images will be at most S apart, regardless of X and Y. And with that, we can introduce uh, the notion of uh, equivalence that we were going to care about. And a map is a coarse equivalence if, so the map must be coarse and you need to have um, some kind of inverse, but it's not really an inverse, it's what is called a coarse inverse. So, which is also coarse. And once you compose them, then not necessarily you come back to the same point, but you get something which is close in the meaning above. Okay. And, uh, well, examples of that, obviously, every bounded space is coarsely equivalent to any other bounded space, right? Because, well, this is trivially satisfied, and so are, is the coarse condition. Also, Z is coarsely equivalent to the real line. Uh, you can just take the integer, uh, sorry, the, the identity here, and to go back, you can just look at the integer part. And even more generally, as long as you have a net of a metric space, and by, by net, I mean a set that is let's say epsilon dense for some epsilon and delta separated for some delta. Okay, uh, so those are the notions on course geometry that we are going to care about, but actually we are going to restrict ourselves to a subclass of metric spaces, which is the one of uh, uniformly locally finite metric spaces. So this is what uh, many people call a metric space with bounded geometry. And I'm going to be abbreviating for now on as ULF just for shortness. So this says that not only the balls the, of finite radius, right, uh, have finitely uh, many elements, but actually there is an upper bound that doesn't really depend on the centered, center, but only on the radius of those balls. So just some, in case someone here is not very used to those, let me just give some simple examples here and some properties of those spaces. So if you have a finitely generated group, say that is generated by this S here, then you can look at the Cayley graph given by that, and you can endow this with the shortest path metric, and this becomes a uniformly locally finite metric space since S is finite. Another way of obtaining uh, examples of such spaces, you can just look at a sequence of uh, finite graphs Let's say that this sequence, uh, each one of them is k regular, where this k does not really depend on the n. So it's a uniform uh, regularity thing here. Then you can uh, look at the disjoint union of all those x's. And inside of each one of the x n, you just want to preserve the metric you had already. But uh, from different coordinates, you just want to give like higher and higher jumps. Okay, so you're gluing x1, then you take a jump to glue x2, take an even larger jump to glue x3, and you keep on doing that. Uh, okay, just some simple, prop not simple, sorry, just some basic properties of those guys. So for instance, we know that those spaces are always coarsely embedded. And by coarsely embedded, I mean that they're coarsely equivalent to a subset of some reflexive Banach space. 
uh, and in case someone wants to know which one, this can be uh, an L2 sum of LPNs with the PNs approaching infinity. Uh, and if you want to embed into something even better, let's say a Hilbert space, then not all of them have this property, but as long as you have a property A uh, or asymptotic finite dimension, right, uh, since it's more rigid, you're fine. But not all uh, uniform little finite metric spaces do that, right? You can get outside of this by looking at expanders. Okay, with this quick uh, sum up of the spaces we are going to look at, let me start talking about the row octopus. So let's fix a set, which for us is always going to be a, a metric space and a Hilbert space. So this uh, is just, we're looking at this infinite sum of the Hilbert space and making it into a Hilbert space. So more formally, we are just looking at uh, functions from X to H, which are square summable. And we're going to be using the following notation here. So if you have an X, which is an element of your metric space, and you have a vector, which is an element of your Hilbert space, this denotes the function that takes little x to this vector, and all the other guys, you take it to zero. Well, this is just the space of bounded uh, function uh, operators. And now uh, the first central uh, information here, uh, definition regarding row algebras. So we are going to be looking at operators with finite propagation, right? So what does this mean? Instead of looking at this definition, let me just look at this picture here. So if you have an operator in B of L2 of XH, you can always think about it as a X by X matrix, right? So you have this infinite X by X matrix and each one of the coordinates, so each one of those dots I have drawn here, they are bounded operators on the Hilbert space H. Uh, and we are going to say that this operator has a finite propagation, or in this case, I'm writing here propagation at most R, if once you look at this band around the diagonal of the elements X and Y, whose distance is at most R from each other, here you are allowed to have some non-zero operators, but outside you must have zero. So this is how the matrix of uh, the representation of, this bound, of those bounded operators here uh, look like if they have finite propagation. And in case H is just the complex number, right? Those guys are just complex numbers here as well. Okay, so now let's define the, the objects I'm gonna be working with. So if you have a uniformly locally finite metric space and then you look at now H just as being the complex numbers, if you take the closure of all the finite propagation operators that we had in the previous page, you obtain what is called the uniform row algebra, which we denoted by C star U of x. And if instead of c you actually have all the, the you have literal two, so you have a separable infinite dimensional uh, Hubert space, then if you look at the closure of the finite propagation operators with the extra hypothesis that they are also locally compact. And by locally compact, what I mean is if you think about this operator as this x by x matrix, uh, each one of the coordinates, uh, each one of those operators is a compact operator on H. So if you look at a closure of all of those, then you get the row algebra. Okay, so let's just take a look at some very simple properties of those spaces here. So if you look at L infinity of X, so here just bounded uh, functions from X to C, right? This can be uh, identified with the diagonal operators in a very standard way. So those are precisely the operators with uh, propagation zero. And obviously then they are inside of the, the row algebra, the uniform row algebra here. And the compact operators, the same thing, right? You can approximate compact operators even by finite, uh, uh, operators with finite many coordinates only not being zero, so you get the same. And here is just the equivalent thing for the row algebra, but here instead of you, I cannot allow any operator. I can allow only the compact operators because it must be locally compact. And uh, sorry, those things here don't actually depend on the geometry of the space, right? This is true for any geometry you, you endow X with. Now, if you want something more specific, let's look at, I think, arguably the, the easiest example you can look at, right? So this is just the coarse disjoint union of singletons. I'm just gluing singletons together and 
jumping more and more and more, right? At least regarding the course type of this, this is the same as what I just described. So in this case, if you look at the matrix representation of an operator with finite propagation, since I'm having those big jumps, I'm sorry, I, I have two cameras here, I'm confused. Uh, since I have those big jumps, uh, uh, finite propagation will mean that I am allowed to have anything in a finite square, but after a while I must be in the diagonal, right? So you get those two things here. Okay, now uh, what were we looking at? So we were looking at uh, how the geometry of the metric space uh, and the structure of the, their row algebras or uniform row algebras interact with each other. So first thing to do, let's do the easy, the easy direction here. So if you have coarse, uh, coarsely equivalent spaces, do we have an isomorphism between their row algebra or the uniform row algebra? So for the uniform row algebra, the answer is very clearly not, right? Uh, coarse equivalence does not need to imply uh, isomorphism between the uniform row algebra. And the reason, well, very simple here, right? So for instance, here, if you have a space, I see some noise, does anyone have a question? No, no? sorry, I heard something, I thought maybe someone was unmuted themselves. Um, so if you have a space with finitely many elements, well, in particular, this has bounded diameter, right? So those guys, the finite metric spaces, they are all coarsely equivalent to each other. But if you look at their uniform row algebra, again, since they have bounded diameter, every operator will have a finite propagation. So you just have all the n by n matrices. And well, if n is different than the m, then the spaces will not uh, have isomorphic uniform row algebras. But uh, this is not the only example, right? There are many examples. Let me just present an example with, with an infinite set, just for you not to think that this is just a, a pathological example. So for instance, if we look at here, our old friend, uh, the square numbers, and here you look at the square numbers plus their successors. So why of this is the disjoint union of just singletons, this is the disjoint union of a metric space of two elements, right? Uh, and they are coarsely equivalent because, well, this X is actually a net of Y. So they, they are coarsely equivalent. However, once you look, if, if they were, if their uniform row algebra were isomorphic, then one can see that uh, this isomorphism actually needs to be an isomorphism between the compact operators as well. So you could take the quotient and you would have to have an isomorphism as well. But the thing is that once you take this quotient here, you're just getting L infinity over C0. And when you get here, because you have those two uh, points with bounded uh, distance from each other appearing all over the tail of this space, you actually get those two by two matrices. Well, here you have something abelian, here you have something which isn't, uh, you get a problem here. But, uh, okay, so, but not all, everything is lost. Uh, if you require this extra assumption that the course equivalence is actually a bijection, then everything is beautiful again, right? If you have a bijection, then you can define actually uh, this isometry between those spaces, the surjective isometry, just by sending this coordinate here, this member of the basis to this member of the basis there. This is, uh, since it's a bijection, this is, a, is an isometry of the two Hubert spaces. And since F is coarse, you can actually show that if you look at this uh, conjugation here, you actually get an isomorphism between the uniform row algebras. Okay, uh, and this construction here will be used uh, later in the talk a couple of times. But now, how is the row algebra setting? So the row algebra setting, uh, it's easier in one hand because actually we do have a coarse equivalence. Uh, sorry, we do have an isomorphism as long as we have a coarse equivalence. But this isomorphism isn't as nice as the one before and let me just explain why. Because so how could you construct then an isomorphism starting from a coarse equivalence? So one thing you can do is, sure, if you have a coarse equivalence, you can, it's not necessarily a bijection, right? But you can restrict to nets of the space in order to make this a bijection. And then what we do is for, we are going to look at partitions of both X and Y. 
uh, indexed by the elements of the net, and you want each uh, set in this partition, which is indexed by little x, to contain little x, and the same for little y. So I'm just picking a subset around the element, and I want it to have uniform bounded diameter. So if I do have this, then, so there is no reason for us to think that this set here has the same cardinality as this set. But once I look at the Cartesian product, we do, so we can fix a bijection here. And we can glue all those bijections together, obtaining then a bijection between X Cartesian N and Y Cartesian N, which I'm calling here G. So now we do exactly the same as we did uh, before, right? Okay, sure, not exactly the same because we need to fix an orthonormal basis first. But we use this bijection here in order to send the basis of our uh, domain Hilbert space to this basis of our co-domain Hilbert space. The fact that this is a bijection gives us an isometry and the fact that this was chosen in this way and that this, those guys have uniformly bounded diameter allows us to actually obtain that this is an isomorph isomorphism, sorry. Okay. But now uh, I started this slide uh, saying that this isn't as nice as before. And the reason why I meant that is just because this is not canonical in any possible way, right? Uh, I am choosing nets. I am choosing partitions. I am choosing a bijection. I am choosing an orthonormal basis. There's a lot of choice here. Why in the other one, once I have a bijection, a bijective course equivalence, I have the things automatically. But okay, so now we know this one direction for course equivalence to isomorphism, but the other way around is what is called the rigidity problem, which is actually the, the hard part. So now let's start talking about the hardest part here, which is what if the, the reverse thing is also true. So if you have an isomorphism between the uniform row algebras, do we have that they are coarsely equivalent? If we have an isomorphism between the uniform row algebra, do we have that they are coarsely equivalent? Or moreover, do we have that they are even bijectively coarsely equivalent? So let me just summarize what is known here very quickly. So uh, we do know, for example, by a result of White and, Wild, uh, and Willett, that if the spaces have property A, then an isomorphism implies that they are bijectively course equivalent. Now, outside of the scope of property A, we can say, for example, that if it, it is inside of the Hilbert space, which is something more general than property A, then we don't know if they're course, uh, bijectively, sorry, coarsely equivalent, but at least they are coarsely equivalent. And the same thing also holds for the uniform rule, sorry, for the rule algebra. If it is inside of the Hubert space, we do have a course equivalence as well. And just a quick uh, remark here, I am writing this condition here, this geometric condition, just because it's an easy condition to write, but uh, with quotation marks, the, the correct notion actually. So what we are actually using is this more complicated thing, which I, I won't get into it because we, we don't use it in this paper. But actually, as long as what we call the sparse subspaces having yielding only compact Gauss projections in the row algebra, uh, this will be good enough for that, which is also more general than, than what I have written here. But, but anyway, for, for, this is fine. So uh, now we want to go deep into the rigidity question. And for that, I need to say a word on how the course, course equivalences are picked so I can move on to the structure of the spaces a little bit more. So a quick word on how those rigidity, sorry, on how the course equivalences are picked. Uh, let's do what we we're doing a couple of slides ago. So say you start with a uniform row algebra there, and you have, sorry, you start with two metric spaces. You have a bijective course equivalence between them. So again, I'm just looking at this uh, canonical unitary here, and I'm looking at this canonical isomorphism. So what we have here, and this is completely trivial what I'm writing, but this isomorphism here is taking this matrix, and by the way, this matrix is the matrix that has zero in all the coordinates except in the x, x coordinate. So this is taking this exactly to E of fx, fx, fx. So we have one here. 
But obviously, we, we, here is the other way around, right? The correct direction is we start with an isomorphism and we want to generate this F here. We shouldn't expect we're gonna have some way of picking something that nice, but what is done is uh, we use the geometric conditions, being it property A or of course inventability in the Hubert space or the sparse subspaces, yielding only compact those projections, yada, yada, yada. Um, we use the geometric condition to guarantee that if you have an isomorphism, then we must have this thing here being bounded above zero. And this is how we picked, pick a map F. So for each X here, F will be picked in a way that uh, it chooses the Y that witnesses that this is bigger than, let's say, some delta. And I mean, then you need to prove that this map actually works. I'm not saying any word on why this map will be coarse, why this map will be expanding or, or anything like that, but that's, that's how the map is picked. Uh, and the reason I'm saying all of that is, okay, now let's revisit the rigidity question a little bit. So if you're just actually, if you only care about the rigidity question, uh, it would be possible that, let's say, I, I give you a, a black box that solves the rigidity question, right? Any isomorphism, I put it in there, this box is split, it spits out a force equivalence. Uh, so it could be possible that this machinery that one could develop would, let's say, once you plug this, just the identity, it gives me minus z, right? The machinery could give you that, and there is absolutely no problem in that. It is a course equivalence, so that's fine. But that's far from what, what we are, this far from what we are currently doing, right? This, the map that is being picked is not just an arbitrary course equivalence, it's actually a course equivalence which is very related to the isomorphism, right? This course equivalence here, it, this wouldn't hold at all, right? We would have just a beautiful zero here. Uh, so what else actually is happening here? So it seems like there is more than just, um, just there is an isomorphism so we can conclude there is a course equivalence. We have actually something stronger there. And that's the starting point of my work with Alessandro, try to figure out what we have there. So what is this stronger thing? Okay, so uh, we are gonna do this for both the uniform row algebra and for the row algebra. So let me start with the uniform row algebra here. So in the uniform row algebra setting, uh, we know that bijective course equivalences are actually the thing to look at. So let's just call this this. Now, if you look at the closed relation, which I defined in the first slide, this actually is an equivalence relation on the set. And uh, looking at compositions, you can also take the, the quotient here, and this is a group under composition. Now, uh, let's just call this assignment here, the assignment I had before, right? So this F gives us the unitary UF, and the unitary UF gives us this um, conjugation here. So actually, it, this construction is nice in a sense that if you take maps which were close to each other, you're going to be obtaining uh, isomorphisms which are, which are the same modular unitary. So they are unitarily equivalent to each other. And this is an injective homomorphism, but the question is when is this actually an isomorphism? When is this map surjective? So for the uniform row algebra, it was actually quite uh, simple to solve this with some results in the literature, at least for property A. So we do know that if the space has property A, this map is surjective, which is the content of this, this theorem here, because the other assumptions for an isomorphism uh, are already clear. And how is this done then? I can actually provide a short proof in here. So this is uh, based on this result here of White and Willett. Uh, and I actually now I'm not certain if this is the year I saw in the archive or the it was published. So Rufus, I'm sorry if this is wrong, but one of them. Uh, so if you have, uh, the result says that if you have a metric space and uniformly locally finite with property A, and you have an automorphism of this uniform row algebra, then this automorphism may be taking this cartel massa somewhere else, but you can bring it back to, let's say its original place by uh, conjugating it by a unitary in the uniform row algebra. And that's the important thing. Uh, you can always just 
change this to bring it back to L infinity, but this element here may be outside of the uniform Rocker. The property A is what uh, makes us able to say that this is actually inside of the uniform Rocker. So with that, uh, let me just give a quick sketch of the proof of the thing in the previous page, not of the theorem of white and load, of the, the theorem in the previous page that that assignment was an isomorphism. So we want to show its trajectory. Uh, we start by looking at an automorphism of the uniform row algebra and applying the result of White and Willett. We can actually find this unitary, which brings the L infinity back to the L infinity. Okay, good. Now we call this composition here Psi. This Psi is obviously equivalent to Phi because well, that's what the theorem gives us. And uh, now using a result of Spackle and Willett, we know that actually all isomorphisms are spatially implemented. Now, not, ne not necessarily by someone in the uniform row algebra, by, by some operator. So let's just call this C, uh, let's just uh, find the V that does that for this C. Now we have the following here. So we have this C which fix L infinity. So and now it's where I'm not going to give many details, but it is not complicated to see that this V in the previous line must be of the, this form here. So it must be of the form that for every X, it's actually picking some other X in a bijective coarsely equivalent way. And here, sure, you allow some multiplication by let's say some sign, right? Some, some complex number of uh, absolute value one, but it must be of this type here. But then what you do is what? We now look at this F. This F not only is related to this V, but this F gives us this UF that we had before, which is the same as this V, but forget about this, this lambda X. This lambda X is just one for all X. So now when we look at this composition, you have someone which is in the uniform row algebra. So you have that those maps here are equivalent and then we get that. So this is uh, how we can get uh, surjectivity for the uniform row algebra. But now what about what happens in the row algebra case? So for the row algebra, let's start all over again. So we need to call this space something, right? So let's look at all the course equivalences. So again, we have a, a, an equivalence relation. Now, so the bijective course equivalence, they were a group themselves. Uh, but here, actually, this isn't a group. Um, for, for instance, what is the inverse of an element, right? Sure, there is the coarse inverse, but this coarse inverse is by no means um, unique or anything, right? So this is not a group per se, but once you look at the quotient by the relation of closeness, you do get a group. So we want to do, to, to look now at the map I had described before. And now this is that map that actually has a lot of choice. So. Uh, maybe is misleading that I have just phi of f. I'm actually, I look at f, I look at a uh, net of the two spaces, right? I look at a partition, I choose a basis. So there, there are more variables involved here. But let's look at this map here. And we would like to be able to quotient by the closest relation and see what we have. But the first problem we have is if you want to quotient by the inner automorphisms of the row algebra, we start having a problem because, well, this guy here is not unital, right? So we need to actually quotient by something else. So what is this uh, something else? So this something else uh, comes from, it's exactly the same definition of the row algebra, but let's forget local compacity, okay? Forget about being locally compact. Just look at all the X by X matrices with entries being an operator on H. Doesn't need to be compact look at the ones with finite propagation and take the closure. And this is the BD of X, so the band dominated algebra of X. So the row algebra is inside of BD of X, but it is strictly inside of BD of X. So what we can show, which is something that looks, uh, I mean, looks very intuitive, but actually took, took us uh, some thinking to actually get a, a formal proof of that, uh, we can show that this is the multiplier algebra of the row algebra. And with that, we obtain that, um, we obtain that actually all the outer, sorry, all the, all the automorphisms of the row algebra extend to automorphisms of the D of X. And you get that this is a normal, can be seen as a normal subgroup of the automorphisms of the row algebra. 
So actually what we do look at is at this quotient here. So obviously you need to check that this is well defined and it is. And in this case, when you, took, when you take the quotients, then actually you get something canonical. It does not depend on the, the nets I'm taking, doesn't depend on the partition I'm taking and doesn't depend on the bases I'm taking or anything. And now the question again is, is this assignment an isomorphism? So is this assignment surjective? Okay, so let's talk about, oh, okay, I, I didn't write it here. So let me just give a spoiler. The answer is yes for property A as well, at least. And now let me uh, say a few words on, actually more than a few words, uh, but let me say some on how to get that. So for first get that, we're gonna be looking at the uh, uniform approximability. So let's look at uh, space X, right? We have the operators with finite propagation, but the elements in the row algebra may not have finite propagation, but they are approximated by elements of finite propagation, right? So it is very natural to look at this epsilon version of having finite propagation, right? So what I'm looking here, I look at a band given by R, and I look at an error epsilon. And I'm saying that A is epsilon R approximable if it is epsilon close to someone with propagation at most R. And okay, I, I actually wrote this approximable in the row algebra here, meaning that those guys must be in the row algebra and you can do the same thing for BTX, approximable in BTX, then you don't require to be locally complex. So the, the main lemma I would say on the uniform approximability thing comes now. So let's look at the unit disk. And now this is just notation here. So if I have a sequence in the row algebra and a sequence of uh, numbers, I'm gonna be denoting by this, uh, this sum here. So once I, when I write this, I mean that not only uh, this equals this, but I, I'm, it is implicit that this sum exists, right? Just by writing this, it's implicit that it does exist. So we can show the following. So if you have a uniformly locally finite metric space and a sequence in the row algebra of compact operators with the property that for any sequence here of numbers in D, not only this exists, but it is in the row algebra, then you can actually say that they are approximated in a uniform way. So for every epsilon, you have an R for which this would be epsilon R approximated and for all lambda bars here. But obviously, if I just forget this lambda bar here and I bring the lambda bar before there is an R, this is clear, right? This is trivial. For every epsilon, for every lambda bar, there is an R for which this is the case, just because it is in the row algebra. So the, the, the thing is to change the quantifiers and put them here in the end. That's the content of it. And um, I must say that this was actually first proved to, uh, for the uniform row algebra in a paper of myself and Ilias Fara. Uh, and then we were able, with, well, quite some work actually, but we were able to generalize this to this case here. But okay, now what do we do with that lemma? With that lemma, I want to think about uh, I, so we know what, what it means for a map from X to Y to be coarse, but I want to have a notion of what it means from a map from the row algebra of X to the row algebra of Y to be coarse. And this is what I introduce here. So we say that a map is strongly coarse-like and the like, I guess, is my quotation, right? It's not really coarse, it's in a metric sense, but it's strongly coarse-like. If, so for every band in, let's say the domain, there is a band in the co-domain such that operators banded by the band in the domain are mapped to operators banded in the band in the, in the, band in the co-domain. This is obviously a very strong property. So let's be less ambitious and look at a epsilon version of it. So here we have our epsilon version, which is for every band and for every error, you have a band in the co-domain and I am sending R banded operators to S banded operators up to an epsilon. Okay, and I need to restrict to contractions here, otherwise I can just shrink and I, mean, I, I can, uh, if I don't restrict to contractions, I will get strong course likeness automatically. So I need to restrict to just, just talking about this to the contractions. And you can do the same thing for BT of X and BT of Y. So this was first introduced uh, to the uniform row algebra. And in the uniform row algebra, 
uh, we were able to obtain that Generally, you almost have this in reasonable ways. In, in every, every reasonable map, let's say, we have that. So as long as the, it's a linear operator, which is strongly continuous, this is satisfied automatically. And by the way, strong continuity here is necessary. You could construct maps which aren't embeddings even, which aren't strongly continuous uh, by looking at ultra filters and, and so on. So uh, we wanted to actually generalize this to the row algebra case, but this is actually very easy to see that cannot be done, not in full generality, but it will be done in, in a way that is good enough for us. But let me just say why this cannot be done in full generality. So why can't this be done in full generality? Let me just give a very quick, a quick uh, contra example here. So let's just look at a space that has only one element, okay? And let's look at why being all the natural numbers. And we have uh, just fix some basis for each. So in this case, well, this is just a very fancy way of writing H. And the row algebra here, we only have one entry right in our matrices. So we just have all the compact operators there. So now what we do, what this map here is doing is it's taking this basis of H and it is, instead of just sending to the basis of H, I wanna be sending to the basis in Y. Right, I am looking at here at a delta n, sending this eight epsilon, sorry, this en to this delta n, and I'm just fixing here one coordinate in the basis of h. So I'm taking this coordinate here where I have all the compacts, and I'm spreading it out all through our uh, all through y. So here, if you look now at this adjoint here, this is well, this is not an isomorphism, but that's an isometric embedding. And uh, it takes the compacts, in this case, it's just the compacts to the compacts, right? It's spatially implemented. And therefore, it is actually an embedding of the row algebra of X inside of the row algebra of Y. It is strongly continuous, everything, but it's very far from being coarse line. Okay, so then uh, maybe we were done and there is nothing to do in this case, right? But no, actually, it happens that actually this thing here is the only problem we may have in a sense, obviously, right? But that's the only problem we may have. And in a sense, what I mean is this. So as long as coordinate-wise, those maps are coarse, this map is coarse-like, we're good to go. So as long as, once you look at a finite set, you look at this corner here, and in here, this restriction is coarse-like, then it's fine. We can actually obtain that the map is coarse-like in the entire space. Okay, so a little bit more on this uniform approximability things. So you could also look at the same thing here we had, but now for the band uh, dominated algebra, right? So first thing, let me just uh, re recall the example from the previous page. Okay, I'm just really rewriting the example from the previous page here, nothing new. And in this case, this actually isn't a counter example because the BD of X here actually is all the bounded operators on H. So we cannot guarantee that this is going to be inside of Y. Actually, this won't be inside of Y. So it is not a counterexample to the problem. And the reason why this isn't a counterexample is because actually you can't. At least if you assume that, and here, unfortunately, we had to add this condition. I don't know if it's not true, uh, if we could remove it, but uh, at least our proof requires star homomorphism, while the other ones, right, they're just linear operators. But here with this extra condition of star homomorphism, we actually do obtain that strongly continuous compact reserving maps are uh, coarse-like. Okay, uh, so that's good and interesting, uh, but for the row algebra, can we say something else? Yes. Uh, we can say that, sure, maybe, not an emb maybe embeddings will not be coarse-like, but if you have actually an isomorphism, then you are forced to be coarse-like once again. Okay, so we do have this very nice property here of isomorphisms. And now what we do is we look at white and Willett's result and we try to uh, create a row algebra version of it. So let me just introduce some notation here. So first, given an orthonormal basis here, I'm going to be denoting this C0 of this basis. Those are just the bounded operators. Uh, such that with respect to this basis, I'm just multiplying by an element of C0. 
And what we can say is, so if you look at an arbitrary isomorphism between uniform row algebras, and now we need property A. By the way, I, wasn't, I didn't emphasize, but all the uniform approximability results have nothing to do with property A. They work for any space. Now is where property A starts being necessary. So if you have an arbitrary isomorphism, sure, but from the previous result, we know that it is uh, force-like. But actually, we can find a uh, unitary in the multiplier algebra of the row algebra, which makes it strongly force-like. And moreover, we can do that in a way that, regardless of the basis you have here, you can be sending this L infinity to this L infinity here, just as White and Willits result have. Okay, so now the goal is to use that uh, to finish the, the problem. And I, I'm not gonna say any word on how this is proven, this takes several, several pages, but uh, so I'm just going to say that we can get that. But uh, now uh, we get the, the main result of our paper is this one. You to have this very strong relation between the course equivalences and the outer automorphisms of the row algebra. And the proof is actually very simple to the other one once you have all this machinery, right? So here's just a recap. I am letting this assignment that takes F goes to UG, right? UG was this, uh, G was the bijection between X N and X and Y N that gives us this unitary. And then you go to F uh, to phi F to get the isomorphism. And then this T is this map we have here. So similarly as in the uniform row algebra case, if you have an automorphism, we use the previous theorem to let's say fix it and take L infinity to L infinity. Now you look at this new automorphism here we call, we, we find the appropriate unitary which implements it. And again, now is the, the hand waving part, but by the construction of V, you can actually guarantee that this will be the case. And then when you look at the, of C, so the isomorphism given by W, and you look at phi F, so the isomorphism given by UG, you have this relation here and you're done, okay? Okay, so this is our main uh, result. And now in the four minutes here I have left, uh, let me just mention some applications uh, that we have for that. So unfortunately the applications are a little bit frustrating in a sense that uh, you guys are gonna see in a second, but either it is a very simple application or it is a very deep result that someone else computed. <laughs> so co computing, uh, Computing this group here is incredibly hard, at least for, for my simple mind. Uh, and even the bijection force equivalences is a, is a hard group to compute, uh, modulo, modulo the relation of closeness. But we do have some interesting examples here. So uh, let, uh, let me talk about them a little bit. So, okay, so let's start with the uniform row algebra. So first, let's look at the natural numbers. If you look at the natural numbers, it's not complicated to it, just by hands compute that you only have uh, the, the equivalence class of the identity here. Anything else either won't be coarse or won't be bijection or something else. So you only have the trivial group and well, N definitely has property A, right? So you get for free that automorphisms of this guy here are all inner. Now let's look at two copies of M. So let's look at Z. Uh, in this case, now you have not only the identity, right? But you can also flip you have minus the identity. And actually those are all the, the, the bijective course equivalence we have modulo closeness. So this will be the outer of the Watson group of the uniform algebra of Z as well. And if we look here at our, let's say our old friend from slides ago, if you look at the course disjoint union of singletons, this is also very simple because any bijection will be automatically a course equivalence in this case. So you just have the permutation group in the naturals. So you, once you mod out, actually you just have permutations which coincide after, after a while. But even for those things here, uh, I'm already not certain how exactly it looks like. At, at least not a beautiful formula for it, right? You can, you can get, get some conditions and some classes, but it just gets more complicated. So I, even for two, 
I, I would be interested in knowing a very precise, concrete uh, form for that. Okay, now for the row algebra, uh, then it's even harder, um, not even for Z, at least if someone knows actually I would be very interested, but I couldn't find anywhere where this is specifically computed. I don't think it is precisely computed what the course group uh, would be in this case. But we do know some things which are inside actually. There are some net nice papers which guarantee us that some nice things are inside. So for instance, we do know that Thompson's uh, group F is in there. We do know that the group, uh, the, the free group with uh, the continuum of generators is also in there. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you guys are paying attention, you guys can see that actually this follows from the easy part of the theorem, not really the part uh, of the subjectivity, right? At least not this part, but I mean the consequence to the outer automorphisms of the reform algebra. But right? it actually doesn't follow from the, the, the interesting part. If you want to actually have a complete computation, though, there are uh, a couple of examples, and I'm mentioning two here, which are very, very deep papers. Uh, so here, for example, if you look at a natural number and you look at the n adic rationals, and you let this be the solvable bounds lag uh, solitary group. So this is just a group generated by two elements here with this relation. Then uh, Farb and Mosher computed that this group actually is isomorphic to. So what do I mean by this? this those are the by Lipschitz equivalences of R. So bijections, which are Lipschitz, and the inverse is Lipschitz as well. And this cross the by Lipschitz equivalences of uh, the n uh rationals. And another example we have here, uh, if you look at the lamp lighter given by a finite, a finite group in Z, so this is F where ref product with Z, then you do have uh, this isomorphism here as well with the semi-direct product with uh, Z2. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, any questions? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Don't you? worry. It was a nice any thing. questions or comments? Okay, so if there are no questions or comments, let's thank Blogger again for a beautiful talk.